Uh, what I do normally in my daily work is machine learning on bioinformatics data sets, and I work a lot with cancer researchers who are looking for the causes of early carcinogenesis and things like pancreatic cancer, which is very hard to like, treat at the moment. So most of my data, I have no background in biology, so I don't understand most of my data at all. And if I look at some of the data, it usually looks like this. Oh, no one can read anything into this. So what I like to do in my free time and other time is actually play with some more interesting data sets, or maybe not more interesting, but more interpretable data sets. And I would encourage everyone who wants to get into machine learning to play with such data sets because you can actually understand what's going on in there. So, for example, I did social network analysis of all Star Wars movies. Well, uh, it got fairly successful. It got even published in the current uh, issue of Pura Science, which is the French version of Scientific American, which I was very excited about. But I actually looked at the actual article, and they are saying, okay, no, what's something? I don't understand French. But they are saying University of Oxford. <sighs> That's a bit like if you are from Warsaw and someone told you, oh, you are from Krakow, right? I don't know like, what's your relationship, but yeah, well, Cambridge and Oxford people hate each other. I'm from Cambridge. So let's not talk about this, let's talk about Stack Overflow. And now you might be asking, so why Stack Overflow? Well, we all do this, right? <laughs> Everyone who does programming does this kind of stuff. And Stack Overflow is actually a really nice data source. You can get a lot of data out of it. And probably if you are a programmer, the first thing you would think about is use their API because they have a fairly nice API that you can use to download data. And it's more sort of targeted if you want to integrate Stack Overflow into your application or something, or if you want to have a bar on your website showing relevant questions on Stack Overflow, etc. But for me, as a data science person, the great thing is that they also publish all their data as a dump. I think every three months. So actually the data I'm showing you today is roughly half a year old, so very irrelevant now. But they publish all the data, which is amazing. You can just download it, it's about 32 gigabytes when it's zipped, which is not that much. When you actually unzip it, it's about 135 gigabytes of data. Is this big data? Who thinks it's big data? Oh, it's not a big data. Uh, my desktop at work has 150 gigabytes of RAM, so it fits into my RAM. It's not a big data. <laughs> and actually, with a lot of data sets, you can just fit them into RAM, and then a lot of problems that you might have with big data, they just disappear. Because I know people who have one terabyte of RAM in their desktop, well, maybe in their server more. So, uh, this is actually how the data look. So you can see there's quite a lot of XML files, and they have from, I know, 3.7 megabytes to 67 gigabytes. So right, these are fairly large XML files. And I was actually interested mostly in users, in tags, and in posts, so that's like fairly doable. Uh, so now what? I got the data. Well, what would you do? Well, this actually happens to me at work quite often when some colleagues comes and hands me just like, here is a box of hard drives, it has like six terabytes, and I'm like, what do I do with it? <laughs> what do you want to know about the data? Because it's usually some data about biological samples and I have no idea about experimental conditions and what they're actually researching. And they're like, well, just find something interesting in the data. <laughs> So, most important thing if you are doing data science or if you are collaborating with a data scientist is have questions. Because without questions, you just have a pile of like, data that you don't have any idea what to do with. So, ask questions. So, I looked at some Stack Overflow questions and profiles, etc. This is actually the first ever question on Stack Overflow. It's asking about setting form opacity and uh, for me, the most interesting thing is that all questions on Stack Overflow are already tagged with their topic. So we have these tags here, and it's saying, okay, this is C-sharp, wind forms, type conversion, decimal opacity. Nice.
So, first question that I decided to ask is, so what are the most common tags on Stack Overflow? Well, that's a completely valid question, but it's not an interesting question, actually, because Stack Overflow already tells you. So the most uh, common tags are here. JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, and PHP. Okay, that's kind of expected. But then I realized they are also telling me, okay, so I know almost 6,000 questions on JavaScript are already asked this week, etc. So they are telling me, okay, when are people asking questions about JavaScript? So I decided to, instead of asking what's the most common tag, to look at when are people asking about each tag. So when are people asking questions? First question, when? Well, now I had some live coding, which I can't really do with one hand. So I'll just put in the code. Oh, thank you, wonderful. <laughs> thank you. So I, I, I'm an F sharp programmer most of the time. So I decided to use F sharp for that. And F sharp has a couple of very nice features for working with data. And I will show you one of them. It's called type providers. So now uh, I have some pre-processed data in a CSV file that has about one and a half gigabytes. So that's already fairly large to just load into my laptop. It takes like a couple of seconds. So what I can do is actually access the data in the file using type providers in F sharp. And what I have to do first is create a type. I will call it a note tag time because the file contains information about tags and when are people asking questions. And because it's a CSV file, I will create a CSV type provider. And I will just give it the address of the file on my disk. And that's basically all I need, because what it does right now behind the scenes, it goes into the file, looks at the beginning, and infers the structure of the file and what are the types of the different columns in the CSV file. Amazing. So now I can just do let tag time. Now I can actually load the file. So tag time get sample, which will load the actual file. And I can do like tag time dot. And now I have various things. I can, for example, look at rows. And I can do c.math fun row. Fun is actually a keyword in F sharp. So <laughs> Fun is not optional. You need to have fun in F sharp. <laughs> so and now I'm going to do all the rows. And if I do row dot, it will tell me names of all the columns that I have in the CSV file. And it also tells me types of the columns. So for example, time is system.datetime in .NET. That's wonderful. I don't actually have to parse the file at all. This is doing it all for me. And I just want to stress out that I haven't run anything. Thank you, I will need you later. <laughs> I, I haven't actually run anything because it's a fairly large file, so I don't want to actually parse it until I know what to do with it. And tag providers allow me to basically write all my code without actually running it through the data yet. And once my code is correct, and because it infers all the types, it's type safe, so it must be correct, hopefully. So when it actually runs, it's all fine which is very important on large data sets. So when I actually ran it, uh, this is for example for F sharp and for different days of the week. And you can see that people are asking questions about F sharp most on weekdays, and then it drops a little on week weekends. Well, then I asked about C sharp. There seems to be a very similar pattern, which kind of makes sense. People don't program that much over weekends, people who have life. <laughs> But what I noticed is that the ratio is a bit different. Just look at it. Do you see? People are asking less questions about C Sharp on the weekends than on weekdays. So I decided to quantify that. And because I am a data scientist, well, let's formalize that a bit. Uh, I realized that what are people doing on the weekends is their hobby projects or open source stuff and things like that. This is my friend Chris. And he is working on the F sharp uh, integration for VS Code that I was using to write my demo. So you can see that it works. And this is him actually working on it on his holiday. So this is what people are doing in their free time. And this is when they are asking questions on Stack Overflow. 
on weekends. For fun. For fun. So, this is, uh, let's imagine a graph like this. So this is people having problems at work and trying to find what's happening somewhere in their system at work. And let's say some people are working on their hobby projects on, in evenings when they have some free time, when the family goes to sleep, etc. And I thought that this will be fairly constant over the week, let's say. And then there is the amount of weekend work. So some people who have time to do weekend projects, sometimes they have more time. And if it's a lot of fun, they may be using it for a lot of hobby projects, and then they might be asking more questions on the weekend than on a weekday. And if it's less fun or they are just stuck at work doing some maintenance or something, then they are asking less questions. So this is a ratio that I'll be computing. And if it's larger than one, that means people are doing something more on the weekend. And if it's smaller than one, they are doing it much less on the weekend. And so this is my weekend index. And the most weekend technologies are actually Minecraft. Kind of makes sense. LWJGL, this is lightweight Java game library. So everything is about games. SFML, Simple and Fast Multimedia Library, which is actually used quite a lot in games to integrate a lot of hardware. And then D and Pygame. So it seems that people on weekends are mostly doing games. That kind of makes sense. And now, what are the most weekday things? Uh, no one does SQL Server Reporting Services 2008 on weekend in their free time. So then I decided to compare the most common tags on Stack Overflow. So these are the 10 most common ones, like JavaScript, Java, etc. And they have fairly similar values between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. That means that on a weekend, people are asking about half the questions they are asking during the weekday. And this is a comparison for functional languages. Because, of course, I'm doing f -sharp, which is a functional language. And actually, the most uh, weekend thing among functional languages, uh, I included Elm. And everyone likes to play with Elm, because it has such nice, friendly error messages. If you haven't looked at it, it's a functional, uh, it's compiled into JavaScript, and you can run it on the web. And it has co coefficient larger than one. That means people are asking more questions on the weekend. So everyone likes to play with it. And the second most weekend programming <coughs> language is Haskell. Everyone's hobby project, probably. And then sometimes people doubt that people are using F -sharp at work, actually. But this tells me they are, because F -sharp is actually only slightly more weekend than all the previous languages here. So this tells me kind of like how popular languages are for people's hobby projects. And then I looked at some projects that are fairly similar in what they are targeting. So for example, Jenkins and Travis CI. Oh, well, this was an actual question on Stack Overflow. It was closed because it wasn't, uh, it's opinion based. And for continuous integration, actually Travis CI is much more used on weekends than Jenkins. And I think the reason is that Travis actually provides free uh, deployment and free continuous integration on their own servers for open source projects. So that's why people are using it in their free time, in their hobby projects and open source. And Jenkins, you have to host it yourself and it's a bit much more work. So uh, that's why people use it mostly in the enterprise and at work. So yeah, think about who's your target user. And if you want people to use your project on a weekend, and if yes, then make it as accessible as possible. So this was my first insight from Stack Overflow. And then I thought, OK, so now what can I do next? I looked at, again, some profiles. And I realized that they also tell me where are people located. So when I go to Poland, I want to know how common are actual programmers in Poland, how many can I meet at a conference. And how many I don't know, C sharp programmers, how many R programmers, how many Python people. So I decided to ask where are actually people located? And Stack Overflow gives you that information if people fill it in. So on Stack Overflow, actually half a year ago, there were over five million registered users. 
and almost 800,000 of them filled in their location. Now you might be thinking, oh, how reliable is that, etc. Well, some of them look like this, Dollar Home. That's an actual location someone filled into Stack Overflow. That's not very helpful. But the good news is that 83% of the locations I managed to match to an actual country in the world. I just looked at the list of countries and tried to match user locations and it matched. Wonderful. So some of the locations were, for example, unfortunately Germany. Well, still Germany. Uh, other people surprisingly fill in their location down to their office number. Maybe they're just expecting some happy Stack Overflow user to come and knock on their door and say, thank you for the answer, that was amazing. Uh, some people fill in their precise location, but I don't think they expect people to come and actually thank them. I actually had to look up this place and it looks like this, very remote research base in Antarctica. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I managed to uh, locate 83% of the people, but what with the rest? So where are the people? Can I ask you again? <coughs> and did I mention type providers? Because type providers are coming to the rescue again. Because now I had over 120,000 of people who filled in, for example, just a town, maybe Warsaw. And how can I find which country Warsaw is in? without actually going to 120,000 locations. Well, there are a lot of services. Uh, I mean, oh, give, me just, <coughs> give me 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so how can I find where people actually are? Well, there are a lot of location services online that you can use. Uh, you can use like Google search, you can use uh, open, open uh, street map, etc. But I use Bing search just because they allowed me to do 250,000 uh, requests for free. So that meant I could uh, do two attempts if I messed up something. So I will show you how I can use type providers to actually uh, query an online REST-based service. Thank you again. <laughs> so this is, just, uh, no, uh, this is just a URL of an example request for Bing search. So again, I will just create a type. I will call it Bing search. And this time, this request will return a JSON. So I will create a JSON provider. And it's again a type provider, which means it actually goes to that URL, downloads the JSON, looks through it, and infers the structure, and gives me a type access to it. I don't have to do any parsing at all. Imagine that. So now I can write my function to look, well, locate place x and bind the result into something and I can do pink search, load, and just give it the URL of my search. Okay, this is it. Now I just have to change the location. Right now I have Prague here because I'm from Prague. But let's put in the location X. And that's basically all. Because now I can do result dot. And this is the JSON document that I got back. And uh, these are all the elements there, and it's quite a complicated ugly JSON. And I remember that what I'm looking for is in the resource sets. Uh, and I can map over that and do something. Resource. And I can do resource dot, and it's in resources because it's an ugly JSON. Are you having fun? <laughs> so now I type dot, and these are again all the elements in JSON. And now finally I have the address. Amazing. So in the address I have country region. Wonderful, I got the whole address. So that's all I need basically. I will just clean this up and just collect the results. 
and I will actually run something for the first time right now to test if it works. This is F Sharp Interactive, the F Sharp repo, and now I can do locate or so, and it should give me the nearest results. So, the, the first Warsaw is in Poland, thank you, uh, the, and there are a couple of Warsaws in the United States. <laughs> but the Poland is the first, so wonderful, it worked. So, if I give it, for example, Cambridge, I think it will insult me again. Okay, the first Cambridge is in the United States. <sighs> uh, but the second one is in the UK. And if I do Cambridge, UK, it gives me UK as the first result. Wonderful. So, you see that without any parsing of the JSON, I got a nice typed access to all the information there. And, uh, sorry? Oh, why, the question is why there are two Cambridges in the United Kingdom. Well, right now the search is set so that it includes mm -mm, a maximum of five results. And there are actually two different Cambridges in the UK. One is in Cambridgeshire and the other one is tiny and it is in Gloucestershire. <laughs> <laughs> Which is annoying to me because whenever I go to, let's say, BBC and try to look for weather in Cambridge, it always tells me, oh, did you mean Cambridge, Gloucestershire? No, I meant the proper Cambridge. <laughs> so, now I know where people are actually. And if you plot it, for example, for JavaScript, it looks like this. Because, well, obviously there are many programmers in the US and in India, so it's kind of expected, so it doesn't actually tell me anything. So, I decided, while well, being a data scientist, to put in some actual equation. And I want to know if I go to a developer event in the country, how likely am I to meet a programmer that does my favorite <coughs> technology. So, uh, this is an equation I came up with. N is the number of located users uh, doing that technology. And the unit of the result of this is programmers per million. <laughs> so, to actually do this, I will need to learn what's the population of each country. And, well, did I mention tag providers? Because there is another tag provider for HTML. Can I ask again for assistance? <laughs> Thank you. So, now here I have a Wikipedia article on list of countries and dependencies with their population. And I don't want to parse any HTML, so I will just create another type provider. Let's call it Wiki. And because it's an HTML file, I will create an HTML provider. And just give it the URL. And that's basically everything. Well, now this depends very much on how the internet works here. So now I can probably extract the table. Well, and get sample, which will download the Wikipedia article. And now, if I do wiki dot, it tells me, okay, I can have a look at the HTML, I can create, look at the lists that are on that website, and I can look at tables that are on that website. And I'm interested in tables. And now if I do tables dot, and if the internet works, Fingers crossed. Yes. Now the, the table that is on that website is countries and dependencies by population, which is exactly the table I want. I don't even have to look at the website because it infers what's the name of the table. And here I have it. And I can go through the rows. And yes, pick it up. And I can do seek.math. Fun row, 
And again, you can probably see that now, if I do row dot, it tells me what are the columns in the table. So there is a percent of row population, country name, date when it was measured, population, etc. So I can actually print things out, etc. And I don't have to parse anything. Very useful, right? This allows you to basically load any of the data sets very quickly into your environment and get typed access to them. And the great thing is that the type providers that I was showing you, they are not just for CSVs, JSON, and HTML. No, uh, they are for SQL Server, and I will show you one more bit later. For a lot of data formats that you can imagine, there is a type provider ready that allows you to just load it into your REPL and just play with it with typed access. So now I had the population, which is amazing. So where are really programmers that I'm interested in? So for example, F sharp, the places I should be in is Scandinavia. It's amazing, now I know to which conferences I should go to. And uh, now I won't be actually uh, typing anything, so I might actually make this by myself. Here I have some code. Start it new. Okay, now I'm starting a new instance of F-Sharp Interactive. Now I will preload some pre-computed stuff. And when it finishes, now it's loading all my data, which is quite big, so it takes a couple of seconds. I can look interactively where are actually programmers located for any of your favorite technologies. So, for example, JavaScript. Ta-da! This is the map for JavaScript. So, JavaScript programmers are mostly in China, Iceland, and then just spread out everywhere. So, which other technology are you interested in? Well, first of all, I wanted to verify if this actually works. So, I was thinking about methods or technologies that are very, very country specific. And I thought, okay, for example, Erlang, it was used very heavily in Sweden, so let's check Erlang. And ta-da! Erlang is mostly in Sweden and in China. Ooh, I don't know what they are doing with it there. <laughs> so, anyone has their favorite technology? Java. <laughs> Uh, let's look at first Ruby, and well, I'm planning to put this somewhere online so that you can look at for yourself. Well, I was actually showing this in Japan, and I was hoping that Japan would show up very highly for Ruby. Uh, unfortunately, not really, because uh, I really don't know what they are doing in China with all programming languages. But <laughs> uh, Let's look at c for example. And C Sharp is actually again in well, quite a lot in China, but again Scandinavia, so these are probably .NET heavy countries. Iceland. <laughs> and Iceland likes F Sharp, uh, C Sharp. And surprisingly, uh, <laughs> well, after the talk, I will get requests to show you like, a lot of things. I was, for example, talking to a couple of guys in Copenhagen, and they were saying that their company uses uh, APL. And, well, if you have never uh, seen APL, it's a very, very specific language with where you need completely different keyboards to actually write it. And they are one of the very few companies in the world that are still using APL. So I looked up APL and it was used in Denmark. So <laughs> I was very happy with that. Uh, then I tried to look up which languages are most common in Poland. Any guesses which will be the first one? <laughs> well, the first one is actually JavaScript. Then Java, PHP, HTML, jQuery, C Sharp, Android, CSS, MySQL, 
and arrays. Arrays is not actually a language, it's just a tag on Stack Overflow. So a lot of people are asking about arrays in Poland. But the most common on JavaScript for Polish programmers is JavaScript. So, well, I was also looking for... Uh, what people in Poland are doing on their weekends, I don't know. I can check later. <laughs> Do I want to know? <laughs> well, I was also checking for outliers because some countries were showing as outliers for different technologies. And one country was showing quite a lot. And it was actually Dominican Republic. And I assume it's all the digital nomads who just like sit on the beach and program there. So if you want to meet a lot of programmers, probably go to Dominican Republic if you trust my analysis. <laughs> Maybe they use the same VPN. That's also possible. Well, uh, oh, this is very, very biased. Like You have seen that a lot of uh, like predictions for elections, they don't work very well, and this has the same kinds of biases. Because, for example, this assumes that people fill in their location uniformly across all the countries, but I assume that some countries will be more, like, where people are more trusting to each other, so they fill in their real location, and then other countries, they just don't fill in their proper location. So, don't trust it that heavily. Well, what can we do next? Well, I looked at tags, I looked at where users are, uh, but tags sort of give me community structure. Because I can see, okay, if people are answering questions with specific tags, that tells me which tags are sort of related, and what, which technologies are people using together a lot. So tags define relationships, and for example, this is me and my friend Chris, and we both use F Sharp. I don't use C Sharp, he does. Uh, we both use JavaScript sometimes. I use R, he doesn't use R, and neither of us uses COBOL. And once you get your data in form like this, you are a happy person if you are doing data science or machine learning because this is a matrix. And you can do anything with a matrix. So for example, rows in this matrix define relationships between people, how similar they are in terms of languages that they use. And columns in this matrix tell me how similar are languages because it tells me how similar are their users. So, altogether, there are over 44,000 tags and over 5 million users. So, that's a lot. Uh, so, I decided to just make this data set a bit smaller, and I looked at uh, power users who have more than 1,000 posts, and tags that are quite common with more than 5,000 posts. And this gave me 800 tags and 1,600 users. So, what I did with this, this is a very high dimensional data set. Uh, I used some very like, quite complicated method called TSNE. So I will just tell you a bit about that. And it's the distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. It sounds very, very scary, right? The important word is embedding because it takes the very high dimensional space and embeds it into 2D. And the way it works roughly is imagine 1,600 dimensional space. And <laughs> easy, right? So imagine a high dimensional space, and there is sort of subspace, a manifold in that space. And it's a bit like a sheet of paper in 3D, but the sheet of paper is just two dimensional. And the data are usually concentrated on some subspace in the very high dimensional space. So if I have these two data points, and I look at it in the three dimensional space, they are quite close to each other. But in the logic of the data, they are actually very far because the manifold is sort of uh, wrapped around. So they are quite far. And what TSME does, it looks at just the local neighborhood of each point and tries to project that into 2D. So if two things are very close to each other in the very high dimensional space, they will be close to each other in the projection as well. And if they are far from each other, like these two points, well, they might be close to each other, they might be far from each other in the projection. So it tries to optimize the local neighborhood. Because sort of the local neighborhood defines what it means to be close in that high-dimensional space. 
So, how do you do it? In R, you would just call function called D sneak. Easy. Well, in F sharp, you can use this kind of power, and you can call R dot D sneak because we have type providers, and we have type providers for R, called R provider, where you can just load everything you have in R and pass your F sharp data into an R function and call that within F sharp and get your results back into F sharp. Very useful, right? I won't be going to run it here because this takes a bit of time. Well, so here the last line is actually plotting it. How does it look when I plot it? <sighs> like this. So this is actually visualizing similarity between tags and stack overflow. Very nice, right? <laughs> because the thing with R is that the best thing about R is that it was written by statisticians, and the worst thing about R is that it was written by statisticians. So some of the things are very nice. You can just call function for anything, but yeah, it's, in some other ways, it's not that great. So that's why I turned to JavaScript, because in JavaScript I can make quite nice visualizations with something like V3. And because I am working with F Sharp, I am using the Fable project, which is actually a compiler from JavaScript, from uh, F Sharp into JavaScript. So you can stay in your nice uh, you know, statically typed language and then just compile it into JavaScript. And then you can, well, this is how it looks if you run it properly. Uh, then you can do things like optimize positions of labels so that they don't overlap that much, etc. So, for example, this is a cluster of people doing Android stuff. And this is a little cluster of technologies related to JavaScript a lot. And WebSockets, etc. And this is a little cluster of people that are confused about object-oriented programming. Well, they should switch to functional programming. Okay. And here I have another version of the same visualization running here where I actually can just hover my mouse over things. Oh, you can probably see the tooltips. I will tell you. So here I have a search, and I can put in, for example, F sharp, and it highlights where F sharp is. Uh, yes, this is F sharp. And here, for example, next to F sharp is another node called Mono, which is nice because all my demos are running on Mono on a Mac. So people who are doing F Sharp are probably very concerned with cross-platform development, etc. Yeah, this is another cluster where it's like redirect, mm, URL, uh, WordPress, URL, uh, HTTPS, and search engine optimization. And this very like complex visualization technique without knowing anything about the actual technologies, it actually gives me groups of tags that are very closely related to each other. So this is very nice. And if you have any very high dimensional complex data sets, uh, I really encourage you to check it out. And it's even used in my work because this is, for example, plot from one paper where they were visualizing how different groups of people are different in terms of where they are different in their DNA. So, now I looked at tags, I looked at users, I looked at technologies. I haven't really looked at any questions and answers. So, what can we do with that? Well, I decided to use another cool thing called word to back which is another embedding, not the embedding into 2D, now this is embedding of words into vector space. And it's actually using neural networks to do that. And similarly, like before Disney, it took point and its local neighborhood and tried to project it into 2D space. Well, what word to vec is doing, it's uh, taking word and its local context of other words that are around it and projects it into vector space. How it does that, it's quite complicated, but it does that very well. So, for example, if I have two sentences, F sharp is a functional language on the .NET platform, and Scala is a functional object-oriented language on the JVM. So you can see that both of the languages are in a similar context in a way. So now I know that the .NET platform is something that the language is on, and the JVM as well. 
and that both F sharp and Scala are closed and functional sites, so uh, they will be used with a similar set of words in a way. And the cool thing is that once I run this kind of algorithm on the entire Stack Overflow dataset, I can do something called, uh, well, I can do uh, algebra with the vectors. So I can compute, so what would be a Scala if I subtract JVM and add .NET? Well, it, well, first uh, answer is actually C sharp and the second is F sharp. So it got that, and it even got that Scala is more object oriented than F sharp. Wonderful. And what I get if I take F sharp and subtract .NET? Well, first one is SML, which is standard ML. Second one is OCaml, and then other functional languages and compilers, etc. So. This even got that F sharp is in the ML family of languages. So it's in a way similar to SML and OCaml. So this is amazing, right? You can get quite a lot of interesting stuff out of that, and I'm planning to put that online as well. So, uh, well, so on the technological side of things, F sharp, I think, is really nice language to do a lot of data processing. Because, for example, for F, uh, I do a lot of R, and in R, it's very easy to just call some algorithm quickly and get the results out of that. But pre-processing data may not be that easy, because it's not an actual programming language. R, I think, is more of a DSL to do statistics. So f -sharp is amazing for that, and I can just do my processing in other language afterwards, but I can call from R, from f -sharp very easily. So, uh, if you are doing data science, it's a lot about the right tool for the job. Just select what works for you for any step of the way. Uh, yeah, I wanted to actually show you a proof of my of this thing before I get to the finish. If I do inspect here, uh, sorry for jumping around, and I go into sources, here is my actual F# -sharp code. You can see that this is not JavaScript, this is F sharp. And the great thing is that with my compiler, I can just put some, mm -mm, I can just put a breakpoint somewhere and rerun it, and it should stop there at the breakpoint. Uh, let's put it in the wrong place. Let's put it in here. Okay, it stopped at the breakpoint because it, it cooperates very nicely with JavaScript. So as I said, if you are doing data science or anything with data or anything at all, basically, uh, just choose the right tool that you like and it allows you to do a lot of stuff and definitely check out Fable. And on the data science side of things, just ask questions, really. And if you want to get into data science or machine learning, Find some data set that you understand, like Stack Overflow or something like that, and play with it. Because it's very interpretable and it's much easier to find what the patterns are than if you are looking at some, let's say, customer database and you don't really know what the results mean. And maybe move to Dominican Republic. Thank you.